Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of Bit South Wrestling Television Network. I'm your host, Boyd Pierce, and lots of exciting action coming up. We'll see the return for the first time since his recent injury here on television appearance of as he looks on the So, Hacksaw adds another man to his army in the person of Hacksaw Duggan coming against Captain Redneck Dick Murdoch. They'll be on the card. Uh, also, I'd like to tell you before we get into the matches, I have a personal congratulations to my good friend and a friend of all wrestling in the person of Mr. Charlie Lay, who recently as a board meeting of our board of directors elected him as our current president of Mid-South Sport. He's highly regarded, former great professional wrestler and highly referee. So we add our congratulations to Charlie Lay. Cowboy Bill Watts is always welcome at our table. He's our guest commentator. Bill, before I turn it over to you, I'd like to remind you that be rigid enforcement, of course, of our guest commentators because of what's happened here lately. We go over the rules from time to time and we don't whenever somebody comes back for the second time because they agree, but no way can you interfere or participate with any match. If you do, you'll be subject to stiff penalty. With that, we welcome you. Well, thank you, boy, and I know what you're referring to. Some six weeks ago, Dusty Rhodes was baited right here on uh, Mid-South Wrestling by Bob Roop and jumped in to take a, answer a challenge. Dusty's never been one to back down from any challenge, and uh, he, he was then jumped by Paul Orndorff, and uh, he kind of got roughed up, and then on the short end of it, he got the $2,500 fine for breaking that rule. And everybody thought maybe it was a raw deal, but rules are rules, and certainly when somebody's here as your guest commentator and you're hosting the program, they have to understand that they are eliminated from all action in the ring. As for myself, it's not very hard. The guys are getting younger, tougher, and stronger, and the fires of desire as far as one-on-one uh, -on -one combat with me don't burn quite as bright anymore. I enjoy sitting with you here and commentating it. And talking about top young athletes, Skandar Akbar has got a former All-American football player from SMU, a former specialty team and nose guard for the Atlanta Falcons, the member of that suicide squad, as Hacksaw Dugan here with one purpose in mind, to revenge for the general, the uh, tremendous, not only a blow to the general's pride, but a pretty, pretty stiff blow to his head administered by the old Marine Dick Murdoch. And exactly. so that's one of the highlights. But let's hear Skandar Akbar talking about Hacksaw Dugan in an interview pre-taped by Reese Bowden. As you well know, General Skandor Akbar has a formidable stable of athletes under his control, and now he's added another man who will meet Dick Murdoch right here later today in this program in a special challenge match. First of all, everybody saw what happened two weeks ago with Captain Redneck, and nobody walks the face of the earth that puts their hands on the general and brags about it. Let me introduce Hacksaw Duggan, a man that was at the top in American collegiate and professional football. They call him Hacksaw because he doesn't stop. Just one look at this man, and you know how mean and raunchy and nasty that he can get, and he'll do it all for $1,000. Hacksaw Duggan, remember the name. You'd better remember Murdoch if you're listening. But with all the big and nasty and vicious men that you already have in your stable, why do you feel the necessity to bring somebody else in to do why the Why should I risk anybody in my stable getting injured when this man is crazy enough, if I may say, mean enough, nasty enough to do it, as I said before, for a thousand dollars? Just some of my managerial genius. If mid off you and protect you, I'll take matters in my own hands, and I will do so. And you'll see it all right here on this program later today as Hacksaw Duggan meets Dick Murdoch in a special challenge match. Well, Hacksaw Duggan built a reputation for himself in the National Football League, and anybody knows that if you're on those specialty teams game after game, you got to be dedicated and a little bit loose in the head because it's a it's a real blind shot situation going down. So Akbar, knowing this young man wants to make a name for himself, he certainly hired him and given him the opportunity here today. Another man, a man of fame, a man that's been known for his intrigue, formerly managed by Rock Hunter, a formidable, formidable opponent, a knowledgeable wrestling man, and a man who double-crossed Ernie Ladd at the beckon of money by Akbar, the assassin. And that's the next one. Let's go to the ring for Reeser Bowden's first introduction. This event is for one fall with a 10-minute time limit. In the red corner at 255 pounds from parts unknown, the assassin. And in the blue corner at 218 pounds from Houston, Texas, Tony Torres. That's the introduction, and on the far corner, the man dressed in black with the... 
I hope that Ernie Ladd is within sound of my voice because I know that Ernie Ladd's very upset over what's happened. But after all, Mr. Ladd, I did what I did for money. Now, I've fallen under a great deal of criticism from a lot of people have written me saying that I did the wrong thing. But I want each and every one of you people out there in the viewing audience to sit down and search your soul and ask yourselves, if you were put in my position and offered the kind of money that I was offered, wouldn't you have done the same thing? That's all I got to say. You be the judge. Well, the assassin better figure out whether he's here to talk or here to wrestle. There's portions of uh, Mid-South Wrestling that are set aside for interview time. But those portions when you're in the ring are set aside for wrestling. And of course, of course Tony Torres, knowing that the assassin and by reputation and by watching him uh, figure to go ahead and try to take advantage of him, the assassin just too big and strong for Tony to gain the three count. As I say, the assassin formerly managed by Rock Hunter, but always, even though Rock Hunter was the manager, the assassin was the, the team leader. There he's got a real tight wound half Nelson there. You'll notice inside he's got the chin under control into a front face lock. Here's a man that we really pulled probably the most treacherous move I've seen and that he and Ernie Ladd were scheduled to meet Afonseca here two weeks ago. And the assassin announced that Ernie, you pay good money and I came because you paid the money, but somebody else has offered me more. It was Scandler Akbar and all I have to do to gain that money is to walk out on you now. And Ernie was so frustrated and he screamed at him, well, why didn't you tell me sooner? Why did you wait till now? And he said, well, that's for me personally. I just wanted to see you made a fool of here on TV. And the assassin left Lad. Lad went and got a partner, Iron Mike Sharp. And Big Mike and Ernie Lad were giving it to the offense, seeking pretty heavy. The assassin came back into it and then Paul Orndorff came into it. So there's a really volatile situation here with the assassin and big Ernie Ladd. And of course, Ernie Ladd's main goal is the one-man gang and at Skandar Akbar and Afan Sika. Grapevine and a half Nelson. And the assassin gains the victory over young Tony Torres and the big cat Ernie Ladd in action when we return after this word from Mid-South Wrestling. This event is for one fall with a 10-minute time limit in the red corner at 290 pounds from Houston, Texas, Larry Higgins. And in the blue corner, at 327 pounds, also from Houston, Texas, former North American heavyweight champion, Ernie Ladd. Larry Higgins in the long white tights being introduced, followed by the big cat in the purple tights, Ernie Ladd. Alfred Dealey called for the bell, here's Bill. Well, Reeser, Ernie Ladd's a man with a purpose. And you know, without a doubt, probably one of the most formidable opponents in the ring. And Ever, one of the most formidable men ever in any professional sport. Dominating both the pro football field as a defensive tackle, Hall of Famer for San Diego Chargers, and dominating it in wrestling. This came off of about six weeks off with a tremendous amount of knee surgery, first time probably ever through the arthroscope surgery in Columbus, Georgia, was ever shown on a national TV program, sports program. But Ernie's back. A lot of people wonder if it's too soon. Next thing they wonder if at Ernie's age, if you know what the knee is going to recover like it did when he was younger. But I'll say one thing about Ernie Ladd. I've never seen a man his size with that much heart. Generally, you've got the big heart and the little athlete, but Ernie Ladd's got just as much heart as his size, and he's a man that's motivated because he feels that he was double-crossed by Skandar Akbar and now the assassin. And you've got to recall that or realize that a man that's 6'9", 320, he has a head start on you anyway. So this man is, uh, and he's got all these tremendous years of experience, experience in championship caliber events. And this makes a big, big difference in a man as far as he's been able to psychologically take the uh, tremendous pressure in any sport. Gives him a big edge on his opponents and that he has the knowledge. So sometimes what you lose a little in loss of the quickness of the step or of the youth, you make up for with a tremendous amount of experience. As Larry Higgin, who is a big, powerful young man, is finding out from the, from the Grand Master right out there. And that right there, that guillotine-type move, that'll put anybody away. And there's Ernie Ladd counting him down. Ernie Ladd with another victory to his long string through the years. We'll be right back after this important message. March 17th, 1982, I'm sure will live for a long time in the mind of Ted DiBiase, also in Paul Orndorff, because that was the day that Paul Orndorff was selected by Grizzly Smith as the number one contender to wrestle Ted DiBiase for the North American title. 
However, Bob Rubin and Paul Orndorff and Skandar Akbar kind of had a meeting of the minds and they laid a trap for young Ted DiBiase because I'll tell you why, bluntly, none of them could beat him. And then Bob Roop double double crossed his own crew and at least in my opinion and the opinion of most people had sabotaged Paul Orndorff's car because he certainly, Boyd Pearson, when I looked at the films, knew when he was talking to you pretty well that Paul Orndorff wasn't going to be there. And then Bob Roop got that match and implemented the plan that he had with Akbar with the one-man gang and Ted DiBiase lost the North American title and was off six weeks with stretched ligaments in his knee. Let's join the final moments of that once again because I'm sure Ted DiBiase is going to remember it forever. The thing that impresses me a lot about Bob Roop is that he's always thinking. Uh, he is a very strict tactician in the ring, uh, much like a very intelligent coach like Tom Landry, the Dallas Cowboys. His game plan is always set before he gets in the ring. He's a very intelligent man. There he looks like he's going for the shoulder breaker, but DiBiase has got some plans of his own. Great power slam. DiBiase with a power Hang slam. Hang on, they've been locking in. If he locks it in, boy, it may be all over right here. Let's watch if he can escape. He's the man that patented the escape. Let's see how it works out. There he comes, giving it all he's got. Roop's trying to reverse the leverage. Roop has reversed the leverage, and now the leverage is on the leg of Ted DiBiase. DiBiase's face, I know, notice in a monitor, look at the, the contortion of DiBiase's face. He is at the hands of Roop now with his figure four. DiBiase has got to get back on his back. He has got to get back on his back to, to gain the advantage. And the challenger all the time applying that much needed pressure. Both these men are in tremendous physical condition, but Ted DiBiase to, to get the advantage, to become the aggressor again, has got to turn him over, there he does. Now DiBiase's got the advantage. Root goes to the ropes. Now the referee has got to break the hole which he does. The referee, Alfred Neely, doing a fine job breaking the hole. Bob Root done a fine job of saving that match when he grabbed that steel cable on the bottom strand to cause it to be broken. And there you see Alfred Neely slammed outside the ring on the cement floor. The referee has hit the, the concrete floor. The referee has hit the concrete floor and DiBiase has taken a lot of punishment on that leg. As a one-man gang, Jim, one on a back bar who's giving the directions. 454 pounds, Boyd. He is really reaching that leg. Look at DiBiase's face. That DiBiase. is a steel ring post. You've seen him wrapping it around. He's trying to break DiBiase's leg. All Referee 454 on the far side, he's still pounds. out. Alfred Neely, the referee, unable to see anything, being thrown out on the far side. Now you see in Roop now as he himself goes for the finishing hold. If he can hold it, the injured Ted DiBiase really being worked over by the one-man gang. Roop looks very confident at this point. DiBiase has sustained an unbelievable amount of pressure from General Skandar Akbar's one-man gang. DiBiase, you can hear him board all the way over here. He's, he's yelling in pain. This match, is, it's all the line right here for Ted DiBiase. It's all the line right here. And Roop has got the whole of the figure four locked in. DiBiase may be unconscious. DiBiase's out. Alfred Neely called for the bell. The referee has stopped the match. Boy, it looks like this could be a very unique situation. The referee has stopped the match. It he looks, gets the bell. What do he do with it? The referee's decision goes to Bob Root. The referee's decision stopping the match to hopefully prevent permanent in, uh, injury to Ted DiBiase. And right here on Mid South, boy, we've got a new Mid South, a new, new North American champion. That's right, and everybody but the referees saw what happened. The big man, the one man gang, under the direction of Scandal Akbar, is responsible. Well, Boyd Pierce, that event that just happened, had I been a guest commentator or any other wrestler, that's when you would really have to test yourself to be able to sit here and take it. And of course, again, even though it was on tape and it's perfectly visible, there's no way Mid South can reverse a decision or change the outcome by a videotape replay, just as the National Football League cannot recall a touchdown or recall a penalty infraction. It just goes in the book as a win, but everybody saw what happened. Let's go to the ring right now because Ted DiBiase is going to be able to tell Bob Roop in physical terms just how disappointed he was. This is a non-title event for one fall with a 10-minute time limit. 
In the red corner at 252 pounds from Blacksburg, Virginia, the North American heavyweight champion, Bob Roop. And in the blue corner, also at 252 pounds from Omaha, Nebraska, former North American heavyweight champion, Ted DiBiase. Bob Roop introduced now shading his jacket and also the introduction of Ted DiBiase, who by the way, Bill will be my guest commentator here on Mid-South Wrestling next week. Ted DiBiase is a great one. He's he's a good spokesman for wrestling. He's a great athlete, and you can see he's a determined man. He he's champion at the bit. And Bob Roop, uh, I think, understandably, is a little bit cautious there because Bob Roop it's almost knows that he has stolen that title. Uh, there's no doubt in his mind. You know, Paul Orndorff was never able to beat DiBiase, and neither was Roop. And yet through this subterfuge, Roop in on a single leg, went for a fireman's carry, switched off to a single leg, but DiBiase pulling him up. Hip heist, hip lock, hip heist, and right into a arm bar, and DiBiase is showing that he's still got that form that made him the North American champion. Of course, Bob Roop is a wanted man. Paul Orndorff wants him, and Paul Orndorff will be back here in two weeks. Paul Orndorff says, is served notice to DiBiase that he's gonna lift the North American title from Paul Orndorff, I mean, excuse me, from Bob Root before DiBiase has the chance. That could sh sure throw that title situation into a rough, tough three-way picture. You know, everywhere I travel, it's really a pleasure to get to talk to the fans and wrestling fans, and of course, even the people at the, at, at the television stations. I was just in Oklahoma City Channel 34, and one of the production men stopped me there, and they said, we're really so glad that Mid-South Wrestling is now on the air here. It's the most quality wrestling show that we've ever viewed, and the athletes are great, and we really enjoy it. And I'll tell you, it makes my heart really feel good to be a part of it and, and to see Grizzly Smith book such great matches right here on TV. This main event right here would be a main event at any arena. It's right here on television. Uh, my, again, my hat's off to Grizzly Smith, and of course, I'll echo your congratulations to Charlie Lay of Tampa, Florida, uh, in his new duties as president of Mid-South. I think it's the most progressive organization in wrestling, and it's constantly enlarging its horizons and bringing matches to all the top cities that the fans are turning out in record numbers. Hammerlock. DiBiase, a determined man. To, Roop's got to be wondering right now. Bob Roop is, is a master of strategy. He's, he's, the credentials are there. We can't go over them. Uh, they're a matter of record. Uh, a national AAU champion from Southern Illinois University, Pan American game champion, Olympian, good in Greco-Roman, good in freestyle, and is professional. Whether you like him or not, it's, he's a formidable, formidable man. Great move by DiBiase, unorthodox move. Roop starting with an arm whip, DiBiase, Change of pace in the direction, drop down, arm snapped him back, and now you see him pounding that hammer lock with those knee lifts. <coughs> oh, Root goes up on that shoulder to try to get some of that pressure off that hammer lock. In amateur, you can't take the hammer lock past the 45, and pro, you can go all the way up with it. Bob Root's trying to stick that hand back to block, and DiBiase into a reverse half Nelson. Well, Bob Roop didn't learn that in his collegiate or his amateur days of going to the hair, but it's effective. Wherever your head goes, your body's going to go, and he, he got out of the hole, and in pro, you got four seconds to break an illegal hole, but Bob Roop is, is really backpedaling there, and that arm is, is starting to bother him as DiBiase keeps up the attack, a, a methodical attack for a man so emotional over what's happened to him, which may be very, very smart. You'd think that DiBiase would be so mad that he'd go out there and maybe get carried away into a scattergun situation. But he's very, very methodical about what he's doing. He wants to beat Bob Roop. He knows he's got to, he has to beat him in a non-title match, or Roop will refuse to meet him in a title match. And Bob Roop also, to show you this, how high the stakes are, knows if he can beat DiBiase here or to just keep DiBiase from beating him, that he won't have to grant him that title match. A pursued man, Bob Roop, by both DiBiase and Paul Orndorff. Orndorff, his former partner, the man that Roop would design it, but Orndorff would execute it. Step over toe hold, puts the pressure on the joint, on the knee joint. That's putting it sideways against its natural leverage or, or the hinge of the joint of the knee. That can be really painful, and that's on that right leg that was injured. 
So Bob Root knows that uh, coming off back off of stretched ligaments, if he can re-injure that knee, it's certainly a point to attack. DiBiase into a wrist lock, step over, going for a key lock. Noise coming up. Break the eyes by Root, break DiBiase off. Introduces him to that turnbuckle. That bring you to a sudden stop. Makes whiplash seem like just a game. Roop firing away now. Chopping into the neck and trapezes area of Bibiasi with a wrist type forearm. Very punishing. Crowd solidly, solidly behind Ted Dibias. Reverse neck breaker by Bob Roop. Roop's bringing out all stops, trying to put away the former champion. You rake off the eyes, kick with the bottom of the foot. That's legal, but it's, as you notice, that's right over the lung area. Takes a lot of the oxygen out of you. Single leg by Roop, he's got the single leg up. DiBiase firing back. And, uh, an unorthodox, unbalanced position to be able to fire, but DiBiase managed to break him loose of it. Double leg dive, but Roop's backing out of the ring. He's going to take DBS. He tried to re injure that knee. He snaps it over the apron. <laughs> DBS writhing in pain, that knee. Now Orndorff's going to, the, going to the ring post. He was going to try to wrap that knee around the ring post as a one man gang helped him do that title battle. DBS got away, but Orndorff's quickly in. Going for the figure four leg lock. DBS rolls over. Kicks free, kicked free. DiBiase firing away. I think DiBiase is ready to throw caution to the winds because he knows that, that the methodical approach with, with Roop, that he's so knowledgeable that he's going to injure that knee. Reverse elbow, DiBiase. DiBiase is sensing victory, Boyd Pierce. I think DiBiase wants a total victory, a physical breakthrough, a total dominance. Power slam! One, two. DiBiase wins it. Look at, look at DiBiase. There's a man that's full of emotion. He's just come over the biggest hurdle of coming back off an injury and a non-title victory over the North American champion. The man who won the title from him, Boyd Pierce. That's so important because you got to wander down deep with that injury. How much would it hold you back? There's Roop up and Roop's challenge him again. DiBiase says, all right, let's just... He's got Roop's old shoulder breaker on him. He put Bob Roop's shoulder breaker to him, counting him down himself there with yep. no doubt. Only with one hand, counting with the other. That's right, Bob Roop knows not only was he beat one, two, three, he was beat physically, mentally, totally, totally beat by Ted DiBiase. And wrestling fans, in just a few moments, you'll hear the sound of the Marine Corps hymn, and as a stranger, the halls of Montezuma fills the area, it'll signify the appearance of Captain Redneck Dick Murdoch and General Skandar Akbar at Better Beware. Listen for those sounds right after this word. And now a special challenge match. This event is for one fall with a 10 minute time limit. In the red corner at 265 pounds from New York City, General Skandor Akbar proudly presents his new protege, Hacksaw Duggan. And at 282 pounds, from Waxahachie, Texas, Dick Murdoch. Bill, there's the introduction of Hacksaw and then Dick Murdoch. I'll tell you, brother, I think two, two immovable objects getting ready to collide out there. You know, Dick Murdoch from West Texas State. 
He doesn't know he's backing up and he went to the he saw Duggan. The big Marine from Waxahachie, Texas, the man that Killer Carl Cox taught the Marine Buster to. One of the toughest international stars in the whole world. He looks like he's in a world of trouble, and Akbar's got this guy geared. He's paying this guy $1,000 to throw caution to the wind, just like he used to do on those NFL suicide squads, special teams that just go out there and try to wipe Murdoch out to pay back Murdoch for working Akbar over here a couple of weeks ago. Murdoch can't get out of that Marine Corps blouse. He, one thing you gotta know when that bell rings, you gotta be able, ready to go to war. That redneck's been in some battles, and I'll guarantee you, and he knows how to get it on. He'll wrestle you, he'll fight you, he'll, he'll run your races. <laughs> Duggan's after him, and Akbar's encouraging him from outside. Of course, two weeks ago, for those of you that missed, Bob Roop was wrestling Dick Murdoch, and Akbar was scouting the match. Murdoch is out on the floor and Akbar was jeering at him and Murdoch got up, went over to his pack, took out a Marine Corps entrenching tool. That's what you dig those foxholes with. And he blasted Akbar and Akbar was carried out and he was unconscious for about 10, 15 minutes back there and didn't know where he was. And he has just been boiling ever since. But I thought Reeser Bowden made a good point when he said Akbar with the one man gang and Alpha and Sika already these formidable opponents in your stable why are you going outside and hiring other people to do your dirty work? And I think Akbar sidestepped the issue. <clears throat> I don't think I often seek in the one-man gang or in a big hurry to tangle with the redneck from Waxahachie, Texas. Dick Murdoch, whose father was a pro wrestler, his uncle was a professional wrestler. Went to school at West Texas State, played football. That's a college with more professional wrestlers than almost any college in the nation. Great number of professional football players. The pro wrestlers, what a, what a tradition. Terry Funk, Dory Funk, Bobby Duncan, Big Stan Hansen, Bruiser Brody. Hacksaw Dugan is finding out that Dick Murdoch he doesn't have to be the first one out of the blocks to get be toward the end of the fight, and there Murdoch kicks him into the thigh area. Driving back into that thigh area. Give you a Charlie horse there, and when they take their your wheels out from under you, I don't care what sport it is, you're in a world of trouble. Dugan sets it a three-point. He went for Murdoch. Dick got out of the way. Whoa, Akbar. Akbar reached out, tripped Dick Murdoch. Akbar from the outside tripped Murdoch. But Murdoch got out of it as Dugan went for the coup de gras. Murdoch dropped that elbow on big, big Dugan, driving it in there. And Murdoch go over the brain buster. Look at him horse up that big monster. And he just drilled him. And Dugan got his welcome to pro wrestling. You can be a star in the National Football League. It doesn't necessarily make you a star in pro wrestling. And Murdoch's going into his Marine Corps backpack. Look, he's getting some kind of equipment out there. His back's to, he's got that entrenching tool. That entrenching tool, Bill. <laughs> and he's going after Akbar. on the run, and I don't blame him because Murdoch will plant you with that thing. That's a steel shovel. It's all in the mess. There he Whoa! Is that a connected? Dugan got up. That's, that's a credit to Dugan is how tough he is. He got up that brain buster. He got, now he's got the tool. The referee tried to stop him. He's got that touch tool. Swing it, Murdoch, Murdoch. That shovel's losing that ring. That shovel's losing. Agbar's going that shovel. Murdoch knows he's got to get back bar and get it. There he gave back bar a little shoe leather. Watch Dugan, Diggy. There it is. I don't know if my warning helped him. I guess that's just my own emotion. But Murdoch sensed it. He caught Diggy in the one, two, three. And the referee gave him the fall, boy. Gave him the fall, and he really whelmed the hacksaw with it, Bill. Another one bit the dust. And speaking of biting the dust, we got it coming next. 
Right, it'll be the Junkyard Dog and Mr. Olympia teaming up after this word from Mid-South Wrestling. It's tag team action now for one fall with a 10 minute time limit. In the red corner at 280 pounds from Dallas, Texas, bruiser Bob Sweetan. And his partner at 218 pounds from Memphis, Tennessee, Kelly Wayne. And at 265 pounds from Tennessee, the Junkyard Dog. And his partner at 241 pounds, the Mississippi heavyweight champion, Mr. Olympia. Rugged bruiser Bob Sweetan and newcomer Ken Wayne versus the Junkyard Dog and Mr. Olympia. Jack Al calls for the bell. Olympia and Wayne in the ring. Well, Boyd Pierce, it's always exciting when the Junkyard Dog comes on the line and as he calls it, he calls it Thunder and Lightning. His, his tag partner that he's developed a tremendous bond with, the Mask Olympian, the Mississippi champion. So you got the best of Mississippi, the best of Louisiana. And these two young men just headline another record crowd at the Superdome May 1st in New Orleans, Louisiana. And they set attendance records all over the country. Jackson, Mississippi, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Oklahoma City, Biloxi. Baton Rouge, Lafayette, Alexander, Houston, Beaumont, San Antonio, wherever they go, because there's one thing about it. You got two great athletes out there, two fine young men, a tremendous team, both great individual stars. The Junkyard Dog has surpassed every wrestling star, as far as I'm concerned, in the country as the, the top young athlete in the business today. You've got the international stars like Dick Murdoch, Dusty Rhodes. Harley Race, former world's champion. The man that's on the lips of everyone as the upcomer, the, the, the heir to the throne, more or less. Is that man you're watching right there, the junkyard dog, and that bruiser Bob Sweetan, one of the toughest wrestlers in wrestling, one of former brass nuts champion. And I can personally testify to how rough and tough he is, because I had many a match with him. He's out there, and he asked to be in this tag match because he's going to wrestle the junkyard dog right here next week for the Louisiana title. And Sweet Tan's the kind of guy that's going to get in and, and check the water and see just, just how cold or how muddy it is and to try to pick a weakness, something that he can do to, to the junkyard dog. Sleeper! Olympia's got the sleeper on Ken Wayne. A, Sweet Tan came in and tried to Pearl Harbor Olympia, but that shows how quick he is. He dropped it, and then Ken Wayne was going to sneak up behind him and Pearl Harbor him. And he got clothesline, the junk guy dog, like to took his head right off, boy. That's why that team is so great and so exciting. That and kind of victory, a home run at any moment. It really was, and we'll be back after this word from Mid-South Wrestling Television Network. This event is for one fall with a 10 minute time limit. In the red corner at 454 pounds, General Skandor Akbar proudly presents his one man gang. And in the blue corner at 234 pounds from Pango Pango, Coco Samoa. The big 454-pound one-man gang against Coco Samoa. Bill, next week now, it'll be the one-man gang in a team match, and his partner will be the mask assassin, their opponent, the big cat Ernie Ladd and Mike Sharp. So really a battle. That's next week here on Mid-South. Boy, Pierce, I sure don't want to miss that one, and you'll have one of the finest young men in wrestling, Ted DiBiase. Former North American champion is your guest commentator, and I'm sure Ted is going to have some some insight to lend, and I'm sure you're going to explore just how he's felt uh, this six weeks with his injury. A one-man gang, a man who has yet to be defeated in a one-on-one -on -one match. You got a lot of top guys trying to find that weakness. The Junkyard Dog, Dick Murdoch, Ernie Ladd, Ted DiBiase are all looking. And they're all searching and they're all testing and they're all probing him. They haven't found it yet. And you look at this Coco Samoa, he's a big, tough athlete. 
Coco Samoa is a much better than average professional. And the one man gang's got him picked up just like a little rag doll. When you give away 100 pounds in body weight, as the dog has to do, dog weigh about 240 and the dog and the and the one man gang 450. Murdoch about 260. DBS about 250. That's a lot of weight to give away. Even Big Ernie Ladd, 320 pounds. This man outweighs him 130 pounds. It's just an awesome thing. The, the, when you look at the body tone, he doesn't have the physique of a bodybuilder or anything else. But they've got that tremendous strength just from carrying their own weight around. And when they drop that mass on you, it just is an awesome thing. And when they hit you, it doesn't even have to be a, a real crisp shot. It doesn't have to have the snap of a boxer. When it's got that weight behind you, it just numbs you and shocks you. So he is a very, very formidable opponent. Wow, oh, he liked to slam Coco Small throw through the mat. Akbar's got a tough one there. The 454 pounds just dropping down. That's it. And another victory for the big man in the stable of Skandar Akbar, the one-man gang. We still have time remaining, and you know on Mid-South Racing, we bring you action instead of talk, so we'll be back with another match after this word from Mid-South Racing Television Network. This event is for one fall or remaining television time. In the red corner at 246 pounds, former North American heavyweight champion, The Grappler. And in the blue corner at 234 pounds, from Richmond, Virginia, Buddy Landau. Action continues now. The mask grappler with the long black tights and the familiar silver and black mask versus young Buddy Landau. This should be a real well-matched bout. Buddy Landell, one of the top young stars coming up. But he's against a man that knows it. He's against a man that has tremendous wrestling ability. Former North American champion, the grappler. Oh, grappler clothesline him there. Of course, the grappler, wow. Grappler got a little too confident himself. And he's the man that's after Ted DiBiase. He says Ted DiBiase is responsible for him having to wear the orthopedic boot. Boy, and I think that orthopedic boot has got a little more meets the eye. I think it's more of a weapon than a crutch. Right into the breadbasket. Solar plexus. Buddy Landell using that speed, but the grappler found a way to clip his wings right then. Oh. You know, this man is a, an amazing man, the grappler. He's very proud of the name, the grappler says when you're one of the best in wrestling, that's what they call you, the grappler. It's a name that's respected by his opponents. We held a grappler with a doctor's certificate. That means that he can wear that built-up shoe, but in my own mind, I kind of have it made up. And I know a lot of fans on television the same way, but it's legal regardless of what we think. Certainly is a crossbody block by Landell. One, two. Landell trying for that fall. Buddy Landell knows what a feather in his cap would be for him to beat the grappler. This time limit remaining about. Two minutes television time remaining at this point. Both these men, this is the great thing about the matches Grizzly Smith puts on here. As he cuts down those time limits, and they know that if they don't make something happen, it's going to be a draw. So they really throw out the stops. So they take a lot of chances. They can't be defensive in this posture. They got to have the offense going. Landell trying for the brain buster, but the grappler blocks it. Turn it into a reverse neck breaker, Boyd Pierce. Grappler just wraps up another one, and that's why they call him the grappler. He will stop Landell's offensive move counted it and took it offense himself and counted it for a fall. One, two, three. Here's a victory for the Grappler, Bill. We don't have time for another match. We do want to tell you that next week, exciting matches following coming right on up. The Louisiana Heavyweight title will be on the line. The Junkyard Dog versus rugged bruiser Bob Sweetan. That'll be a battle, boy. That certainly will. Sweetan was a former Brass Knucks champion and one of the most rugged competitors in the Mid-South area. Junkyard Dog, the living legend already, the Louisiana State Champion, should be a great one. And you and got this, another big tag match. Special tag team title oh, bout, the One Man Gang and the Assassin versus the Big Cat Ernie Ladd and Canada's top athlete, Mike Shorn. 
Well, I tell you, there's a lot in there because Ernie Ladd has a score to settle with both those men. The one-man gang is the man that came in on the double cross and caused him to have knee surgery. And the assassin then double, double crossed him. So Ernie Ladd's got a mission and he's got Iron Mike Sharp, a stalwart that he teamed with formerly in Atlanta. So next week could certainly be a formidable card and Ted DiBiase being your guest commentator, it should be exciting. I want to thank all the fans for having us in their homes again today. It's been my pleasure being here with you, Boyd. Thank you, Bill, and Boyd Pearson. Goodbye, everybody, until next week on Mid-South Wrestling Television Network. Hello, wrestling fans, and welcome to another week of Mid-South Wrestling Television Network. I'm your host, Boyd Pierce, and Grizzly Smith with another outstanding card. It will be headlined with the Louisiana Heavyweight Championship on the line, the Junkyard Dog defending his coveted belt against the challenge of bruiser Bob Sweetan. Tag team action sees the big cat Ernie Ladd team up with Iron Mike Sharp against 454-pound one-man gang and his partner, the Masked Assassin. So a lot of action coming up. We have with us... And we want to welcome to him at this time the former North American heavyweight champion, a good friend of mine, and all you people on Mid-South Wrestling, Ted DiBiase. And Ted, I want to congratulate you on that non-title victory last week over Bob Roop. And I know that it was not only a psychological, but it was a physical and emotional victory. And I was pulling for you all the way. I just want to know, and the fans want to know, how's the leg holding up? Well, boy, thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to be back with Mid-South Wrestling. And the leg uh, physically is coming along fine, but along with the uh, physical improvement on the leg, the psychological factor is that uh, when you've had an injury like that and when you've recovered from it psychologically, uh, you're not sure yourself, you're not sure that you want to test the leg, and the best way to test it is go ahead and get out there and get in the ring with somebody that's accomplished, somebody that's going to give you a hard time, and when you get into the heat of the battle, you have to forget about the injury and you just have to go full speed ahead, and last week, just like you said, it was a great victory for me because I proved to myself and everybody that the leg is healed, and uh, the victory over Bob Roop was sure one that I treasured. I know you'll be going for the title again in a sanctified challenge title match. Right now, since you've been gone, the Skandarak Bar has continued as general of his army. He brought in another mercenary in the form of Hacksaw Duggan. Last week he met Captain Redneck Dick Murdoch. And let's just join the final moments of that match and see what happened. Duggan sets on a three-point. He went for Murdoch. Dick got out of the way. Whoa, Akbar. Akbar reached out, tripped Dick Murdoch. Akbar from the outside tripped Murdoch, but Murdoch got out of it as Dugan went for the coup de gras. Murdoch dropped that elbow on big driving it in there. And Murdoch going for the brain buster. Look at him horse big monster. And he just drilled him and Dugan got his welcome to pro wrestling. You can be a star in the National Football League. It doesn't necessarily make you a star in pro wrestling. And Murdoch's going into his Marine Corps backpack. Look, he's getting some kind of equipment out there. His back's to, he's got that entrenching tool. That entrenching tool, Bill. <laughs> and he's going after Akbar. Akbar's on the run, and I don't blame him because Murdoch will plant you with that thing. That's a steel shovel. It's all in the mouth. There he Whoa! Is that a connection? Dugan got up, that's, that's a credit to Dugan, is how tough he is, he got up that brain buster. He got, now he's got the tool. The referee tried to stop him, he's got that touch tool. Swing and Murdoch, Murdoch. That shovel's losing that ring. That shovel's losing, Akbar's going that shovel. Murdoch knows he's got to get Akbar to get it. There he gave Akbar a little shoe leather. Watch Dugan, Diggy! There it is! I don't know if my warning helped him. I guess that's just my own emotion. But Murdoch sensed it. He caught Dugan in the one, two, three. And the referee gave him the fall, boy. Gave him the fall, and he really whammed the hacksaw with it, Bill. Another one bit the dust. Ted DiBiase, we saw what happened, and a lot of times it doesn't work out this way. A person is injured, and they never come back to face the man that caused it all. But the tide may be turning for General Skandar Akbar. You have returned. Ernie Land is returned, Dick Murdoch is back, all of them out with injuries with responsibility as General Sc Scandal Akbar behind it all. So the tide may be turning for Akbar. Right now, we have Dick Murdoch versus Larry Higgins. Here's the introduction of the first match in Reese Bout. This event is for one fall with a 10 minute time limit. In the red corner at 290 pounds from Houston, Texas, Larry Higgins.
And coming into the ring now at 282 pounds from Waxahachie, Texas, Dick Murdoch. Marine Corps him, the old Montezuma, and there is the redneck himself, Captain Redneck is about. Sounds Dick Murdoch against Larry Higgins. Ted DiBiase, our guest commentator, gives us his expert commentary as you see fit, Ted. I'll tell you what, Boyd, say what you may about Dick Murdoch. Uh, as everyone well knows, he's a very good friend of mine, has been for a long time. They call him Redneck, they call him a lot of things, but one thing you gotta call him is Double Tough. And uh, just like myself, Dick Murdoch right now has got a lot of things on his mind. Skandar Akbar, the one man gang, to be sure, at the top of his list. And uh, he's out right now, as you can see by what's going on in that ring, to do some damage to some people. Alfred Needy calls for the break and Murdoch backing away, but always in his mind, watch him. Looking at his opponent, when his opponent moves away, he turns with him simultaneously, Ted. Well, behind, he's riding him, got him down on the mat. Big Larry Higgins, no small boy by any means. But trying to force those shoulders to the mat. the rope, a hole had to be broken. Bob Roop, the North American heavyweight champion that you gained a non-title victory last week, will be in our next match, followed by the Mississippi heavyweight title holder, Mr. Olympia, is on this week's card. A big title match, a junkyard dog defending the Louisiana crown versus the challenge of bruiser Bob Sweetan. Dick Murdoch taking him back down, keeping that face. Got a front face lock on him. Big elbow to the face. Back drop. Here comes Big Bertha. That's ended it for a lot of men. Three count, and that's it, boy. One, two, three. Captain Redneck, Dick Murdoch, with a victory to start this week's program, and we'll be back after this message from Mid-South Wrestling. This is a non-title event for one fall with a 10-minute time limit in the red corner. At 252 pounds from Blacksburg, Virginia, the North American heavyweight champion, Bob Root. And in the blue corner at 234 pounds from Richmond, Virginia, Buddy Landell. Buddy Landell setting his black sequin jacket against the North American heavyweight champion Bob Roof in a non-title match. Your guest commentator, the former champion Ted DiBiase, who gained a victory over Roof last week in a non-title match. Ted, I know that you're sitting here and your eyes are set back as you watch Roof in any kind of action. Well, I guarantee you, boy, uh, it goes without saying. I think everybody knows how I feel about Bob Roop. And uh, I'm just here to say that last week, last week what took place was a, a feather in my cap. It was a, a great win as far as I was concerned for myself, but it was only the beginning as far as I'm concerned. Not only do I want the North American title back, but I want a little bit of revenge on Bob Roop for what he did to me. There's been a lot of people hurt, a lot of people injured, and I don't think there's any place in professional wrestling, not in my sport, for men like this that'll go ahead and try to win the victories, win titles, and take the money and try to injure you and put you out of your career. Buddy Landell in there with Bob Roop right now. I've watched him come along uh, and in the while that he's been here in the Mid-South. Very promising young wrestler. Shows a lot of promise, a lot of courage, a lot of heart. I will say I don't know that if that uh, he has the ring wise, of course, that Bob Roop does, but the, he's in tremendous shape. And I've seen many times over the years where a lot of shape and uh, determination and heart have overcome a lot of knowledge in that ring. Exactly, and Buddy Landell on the rise as a young star. And of course, for a lot of our viewers that have joined our network, in the past few weeks, we'll go back and recall some of the 
exploits of Bob Roop, who is a North American champion, but he's a former AAU champion. He was an amateur great at Southern Illinois University. Now he's a North American heavyweight title, so he, he has a qualification as Buddy Landell with that hammerlock on Bob Roop. Right now, Buddy Landell in control, working on that arm. Again, Roop going into taking every advantage that he can. And he drops down, drives the knee, drives an elbow into the midsection of Bob Root. In typical Bob Root fashion, backing up. That's when you got to watch him, keep your eyes on him, Boyd. He backs up in that corner and tries to lure you in there. You take your eyes off for a minute, just like I said, and he's got the advantage again. Driving ahead of Buddy Landell into that turnbuckle. Two hands full of hair. Bob Roop will take advantage of you in every way that you can imagine. Another thing that a man shouldn't do, Ted, and as you see Roop sending remarks over to you when he has another opponent in the ring, a lot of times you can take your opponent too light, you can be too over eager, and the man can come a loose. He's a professional wrestler too, and it just takes one, two, three seconds for you to lose a match while you're pointing ahead to somebody else. Well, he's deliberately trying to taunt me, Boyd, and it's not necessary. Again, going to that hair. He certainly doesn't need to taunt me, Boyd, because all in good time, he'll have his chance with me. I guarantee you that. Hey, Landell with a move coming down. He's got him down, one, two. On the two count. Quick move by Buddy Landell. Just like you said, he may have uh, underestimated young Buddy Landell. Bob on the defensive right now. Buddy Landell taking the neck. Two slams. Dropped a big elbow to his chest. One, two. Got a two count on him. Oh, he's got him. Oh, reverse. Oh, caught his throat right across that top rope, Boyd. Looked like he had him for the roll-up. Bob Rope ducked between the top and the second rope. Buddy Landell caught his throat right on that top rope. Big high knee. Bob Rope has his hand raised in victory. We'll be back when action follows after this word from Mid-South Wrestling Television Network. This is a non-title event for one fall with a 10-minute time limit. In the red corner, at 218 pounds from Memphis, Tennessee, Kelly Wayne. And in the blue corner, at 241 pounds, the Mississippi heavyweight champion, Mr. Olympia. Action continues now with the introduction of Ken Wayne, the blonde-haired rapper in the yellow and black tights. Alfred Neely called for the bell. Wayne will be facing the Mississippi heavyweight champion, Mr. Olympia, Ted. Mr. Olympia, uh, I enjoy watching uh, Boyd. The man is very quick. As you can see there, sitting out very quickly, getting away from his opponent. He's a very quick, agile athlete, very well conditioned, and has come a long way since he came into the Mid-South area, gaining the Mississippi heavyweight title. Recently, I know, tagging up with the Junkyard Dog and faring very well as the dog's partner. This is a non-title match for the Mississippi belt. But later on this week, stay with us because the Louisiana heavyweight belt is a sanctioned title match. The Junkyard Dog defending against Bruiser Bob Sweetan. And what about the big tag match? Big Cat Ernie Land and Iron Mike Sharp versus 454-pound one-man gang and the Masked Assassin. That's coming up next, Ed. That's right, boy. And you can bet I'm going to be watching that very carefully. Uh... The one -on -one now you see the speed and agility of the Mississippi champion, Mr. Olympia. Big back high in the air on his back, boys. 
coming out on the floor, boys. I'm going to come out here and think about this for a while. Ken Wayne on the outside, Mr. Olympia on the inside waiting for his return. Mr. Olympia always uh, one step ahead of his appointment. Wayne complaining that Olympia pulled his hair. You saw the warning from Alfred Neely. Ken Wayne very wisely backing out of that corner. Ken Wayne taking advantage now. A few cheap shots there in the corner, elbows to the side of the head of Mr. Olympia. Mr. Olympia ducks it, boom! Double, big drop kick, down he goes. He's got him mad now. With that press slam, a big high slam. Big elbow to the chest, Mr. Olympia. Another big elbow to the chest. He got him mad, boy. Sleeper hole, he's got the sleeper, boy. I haven't seen anybody get out of that yet, boy. Ken Wayne going down. The free Alfred Neely. Checking those arms, see if he's still there. The lights go out for Ken Wayne as the sleeper hold is successful applied by Mr. Olympia. We'll be back with a big, big, big tag team battle after this word from Mid-South Wrestling. It's tag team action now for one fall with a 10 minute time limit. In the red corner at 255 pounds, the assassin and his partner at 454 pounds, the one man gang. Yeah, the introduction of the one man gang and the assassin. Here comes Ernie Lane. Coming into the ring right Mike now Sharp. at 327 pounds from Houston, Texas, former North American heavyweight champion, Big Ernie Ladd and his partner at 287 pounds from Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, Iron Mike Sharp. Now they all four in the ring, of course, they're escorted on the other side by General Skandar Akbar. Yeah, turn right into that one man gang, and I can't say that I blame him. Boy, I don't have anything in common with Ernie Ladd, if there's one thing I did have in common with him is that man he's pounding on right now has got some dues to pay as far as I'm concerned, and I, somewhere down the line, I want a piece of that action myself. Jack Cow trying just to get order restored. Forward, Big Mike Sharp and Ernie Ladd taking a fight right to him. Mike Sharp and Ernie Ladd in the ring, but outside Akbar has his gang, the one-man gang and the assassin. Jack Al wants one from each team. He has two from one team and none from the other right now. You can see Ernie Ladd's big and, big and fired up right now, and I can, I can, I can tell you, I, I know just exactly how he feels, Boyd. Six long weeks I sat and thought about those two men right there along with Bob Root and what I could do to him when I got back. Right now, big Ernie Ladd taking it and hammering it to that big one-man gang, as he calls himself. Got him right up on that top turnbuckle. Mike Sharp got the bear hug on the assassin. Big Ernie Ladd, big chop. One-man gang out on the floor. Ernie Ladd but the 454 pound man on the floor and Mike Sharp squeezing and squeezing on the assassin. Boy, they're taking a fight right to him. Thumb to the eye by the assassin. Right back into that bear hug. Powerful Canadian Iron Mike Sharp and now Ernie Ladd in legally. Big Ernie Ladd in. Mike Sharp whips him across the ring into the ropes. Big boot to the head by Big Ernie Ladd. Ernie Ladd shaking that finger at the assassin. And that core is frantic on the outside of the ring. Got him up by the throat. Got him up again by the throat, shaking him. There he goes. Assassin over this corner looking for a little relief. Ernie Ladd spinning them hands saying, come on in here, I want you. 
two big, big men now. Confrontation, one-on-one. -on -one. One man gang and Ernie Ladd. That's two real big men in there right now, boy. Assassin taking a cheap shot here. Big Ernie Ladd just not taking anything from anybody today, boy. Fighting them both now. I'm sure in the back of Ernie Ladd's mind, he's thinking, this man's cost me a lot of time, a lot of money, and a lot of pain. And I'm gonna give a little bit of it back to him. Ladd's giving it back now, trying to that foot, using that elbow, everything you can. Akbar is in trouble. You're back, Murdoch's Boy, back, Ladd's what, back. Boy, I'm enjoying this. There's no love lost between me and Ernie Ladd, but I am enjoying this. Down. Talk about a wallop to the midsection. One man gang looking, looking to hide someplace in there now. Into that knee of Mike Sharp. Dropping that one, dropping his throat right across the ring. He wants out of there now. Looking for a little relief. Land in the assassin. One more time. Mike Sharp dropping that throat across that top rope. I know I'm supposed to be unbiased, Boyd, but I'll tell you what, I'm enjoying this. It's time for a big drop kick. It's time some dues were paid, and Mike Sharp and Ernie Ladd are taking a fight right to them. You're seeing four big men with maneuvers and ability of 180-pound grapplers. Big lock by around. Mike Sharp off of the ropes. Big tackle. Down he goes. Knee into the back. Referee Jack Al didn't see that knee. One man gang caught Ernie him. Ernie Ladd coming across the ring. Referee trying to restore a little order. Assassin putting Mike Sharp in that Boston crowd. That's a very painful hole. One man gang coming in right, right there, boy. Now I can't stand to see that. To the man deliberately trying to hurt action. him. I can't stand to see that. That's what I mean, boy. I can't stand to see this go on. Deliberately trying to injure the man. Not trying to just beat him, but trying to deliberately injure him. Ernie Ladd in there taking a fight again. He's got a bolt. What? I can't stand it, Boyd. I can't. He's trying to turn him over. I can't. I'm not going to stand by. Henny! Henny! And he's gone from our table, Ted DiBiase. He up in the street of light, he couldn't handle it. Referee Jack Cow called for the bell, but Bedlam is all broke loose in the ring. There goes the one man gang, and Akbar's gone, thrown by DiBiase. Ernie Ladd as Mike Sharp is out of action on the far side. The assassin is out. Ted DiBiase couldn't stand it any longer. He was gone. I couldn't stop him. I wouldn't want to. I understand. He may have repercussions from President Charlie Lay, but ladies and gentlemen, he done it. He had to do it. And we'll be back. Disqualification was called, as you see, our referee Jack Howe coming over and giving the official. What is it, Jack? We're uh, disqualified Ernie Land because of the interference of Ted DiBiase. Disqualification of Land and Sharp, the interference of Ted DiBiase. We'll be back after this word from Mid South Wrestling. Well, Boyd Pearson, you know, since you obviously lost the commentator, Ted DiBiase disqualified himself from being a commentator, actually, probably from being a wrestler. I think it'd be suitable that the North American champion would be out here to com commentate on a few matches. You know I never run in anybody's matches, so I can sit out here, make some appropriate comments, and, and, and comment on the matches without having to worry about interfering. Like, you know, I'm sure one of Charlie Lay, the new president, I'm sure one of his first moves is going to be, in fact, I'm going to call him right after this program and recommend that he find Ted DiBiase at least 2,500, like Dusty Rhodes. Remember Dusty Rhodes, 2,500? In this case, it probably should be 5,000. And Boyd, since you were right here and you saw it all, I expect you to corroborate it. When Charlie Lay calls you, I expect you to say, yes, Mr. Lay, I saw him do it. Just like Bob Roop says, he should be fined, perhaps suspended, whatever. Now, I'm going to collaborate to you. I'm going to tell you something right now. You brought yourself out here. I'm the host of this program. I did not invite you. Ted DiBiase done what he had to do. 
in his heart, and I am not second in anything, whatever you say to Charlie Lay. And if you want to stay out here, you brought yourself here, you'll direct your comments to this match, and you'll not use it as a sounding board to promote yourself as North American Heavyweight Champion. We're going to the ring for the introduction of this match. If you want to stay under those stipulations. I, I would never do that, mister. I would never do that, boy. I'd never do that. I'll just comment on the match. And now a title match. For the Louisiana now, Heavyweight Bob Championship. Sweetan is, uh, known, uh, this event is for one, one fall or remaining now. television time. In the red corner, at 280 pounds from Dallas, Texas, bruiser Bob Sweetan. And at 265 pounds from Tennessee, the Louisiana heavyweight champion, the Junkyard Dog. This is the Louisiana heavyweight championship match sanctioned by Mid-South, the Junkyard Dog holding the title belt signifying that he's the champion against the challenger, Bruiser Bob Sweetan. And Bob Roop has slowed down a little bit, kind of settled down. I hadn't settled down because I'm right with Ted DiBiase. Y'all taunting and baiting has got to stop. A man can only take so much. Well, these are a couple a couple superstars out here. Bruiser Bob Sweetan's known all over the country. Junkyard Dog is the number one superstar in the country today. I mean, these are men in my class, North American heavyweight title class, a couple of giants in the wrestling profession. I would never come out here to promote myself, boy. Never. That'd be DBS. You should be fine. Bob Sweetan goes for a hip toss. Junkyard Dog was a little too fast. Look. That man is powerful. Both men. Sweet Tan came out of that. Junkyard Dog weighs at least 280 pounds. He doesn't have an ounce of fat on him. And Sweet Tan managed to come out from under him. He didn't push him off, though. He just slid out from under him. Very, very strong men. These men train like I do. They're very, very strong. Now, again, Sweet Tan using that strength. He makes no bones about it. He calls himself Bruiser. Look at that. A forearm. Knocked the junkyard dog right down. That's very rare. Knocked him down again. This man can punch. He can drop it. Look, he's got his weight on him perfect. What's? Well, now that junkyard dog is strong. Strong. He can punch too. The headbutt by junkyard dog since Bruiser Bobber's sweet tan. Now he's the former brass knucks champion, rugged as they come and the challenger in this match. You know, both these men have got tempers. You know, they're like me. Once they lose their tempers, they're kind of out of control. Junkyard dog, there's a lot of muscle flying around in there. That junkyard dog, look at him. Is he confident? He's a powerful man. He gave Sweet Town a little too much room that time. You cannot give a veteran like Sweet Town an inch. He's, now he's got him in a head lever. He's bringing that weight. That pressure, cutting off that air. I know he's not choking him, but I mean, he is, he's using his weight and he's using his, 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 the mass of his arms and everything to bring pressure to bear. The junkyard dog is bearing his weight. Sweet, Sweet Tan is definitely scoring points. Got him on his back for one count. A bridge, the junkyard dog can bridge with 280 pounds on him. That referee is trying to get where he can see everything. Well, apparently Sweet Tan does not feel that the junkyard dog has been beaten down enough. I think it's a mistake that he took his weight off him. But apparently he knows what he's doing. He wants to bruise him. They're trading punches. Uh-oh, he gave him too much room again. Junkyard dog with that 22 inch arm, that fist at the end of it, that when it connects, it means something. Hits him with that tackle, oh, drove him clean out of the ring. Drove him right through between the ropes onto the cement floor and followed it up. Now the junkyard dog is obviously breaking the rules here. He should let the man back in the ring like I would. Hey, he hit him with, uh, 
Hey, that looked like karate, but that's uh, it's legal karate. It wasn't illegal. The sweet hands going for a perfect joke. I got power slam. I don't believe that. Off of the ropes are giving that added leverage. I don't believe that. One, two, three, and still, Louisiana heavyweight title holder, the Junkyard Dog, by gaining a victory over bruiser Bob Sweetan. That man deserves to be champion. He's in my class. More action coming up after this word from Mid-South Wrestling. This event is for one fall or remaining television time. In the red corner at 234 pounds from Chattanooga, Tennessee, Ron Cheatham. And in the blue corner at 223 pounds from Alexandria, Louisiana, Rick Ferrara. Ron Cheatham in the long purple tights versus the muscular built Rick Ferreira, a real strong man as far as stature is concerned. Inside that body, Bob Roop, a great competitor. Well, he's a veteran, Boyd, and uh, he's capable of anything. Uh, he knows a lot of counters, a lot of moves. You talk about strength, he was able to take the man over practically with one arm. Once he got the momentum swing in his direction, Ron Cheatham, a younger man, uh, I don't know a whole lot about him, and uh, I, I imagine I'm going to find out something in the next few minutes. Ricky Ferrer is definitely a ring general. In this case, Cheetah Manson. He threw him off, but he didn't do anything with it. Oh, he caught him that time. It looked like a glancing knee. Ricky Ferrer caught with a drop kick. In this case, it looks to me like uh, Cheatham is a little bit disorientated, not exactly sure. It doesn't look to me, boy, like he has a game plan like I would have, but he's working on the head lever. He's also, if you can see, he's given Ricky Ferrer a chance for a, a very short suplex. Didn't look like it do much damage, but it does get the man on his back. And you notice that now for, uh, Ferrer, his weight is on Cheatham, and that is the place to make your opponent carry your weight. Again, Ferrer, maybe not so great in his balance on that move right there because either that or Cheatham is stronger than he looks. Bob is a junkyard dog gained a victory over Bruiser Bob Sweetan in that title match, which was one fall or no time limit TV time remaining. That means all the rest of the matches become standby matches. Well, Mid-South, Mid -South, even, even their standby matches are usually better than some of the main events on other, other television uh, programs that I sometimes watch. Uh, you know, just to sort of uh, compare the uh, opposition. All the top talents in this area, everybody knows that. Nice arm drag by Cheatham. Well, there's no sense in having a title match for him just going to have a five or ten minute time limit. So that's the reason to have it earlier in the card with no one fall or TV time remaining, which gives it plenty of time for, a, for it to be actual title match. No one can come back and say, well, I just had five minutes or ten minutes in a sanctioned title well, match. Well, that's true. These people, the champions for Mid-South, they never make excuses or any kind of phony excuses about losing or, or anything. And, uh, uh, yeah, the Junkyard Dog had plenty of time, and, and uh, Bob Sweetan had plenty of time, and uh, uh, they were like me. They were both great. They were both very, very good. Uh, uh, Ted DiBiase should be fined at least uh, $2,500, if not suspended, and uh, uh, Charlie Lay. Now again, Straight uh, across the eyes now by Ron Cheatham, as I asked you before and requested that you stick to the action inside the ring, not as sounding board for you personally or what should be done to Ted DiBiase, please. Well, you're right, but you know, now, in this, now this, this match is getting a little bit, some punches and some kicks. You don't see me running in like Ted DiBiase. I'm not going to be fined $2,500. Anyway, I'll just comment on the match. Uh, Cheatham goes for a slam. He got him up easy. Ricky Ferreira come down on the base of his spine. Ricky, Ricky Ferreira caught him in a small package. Ferreira caught him and it resulted in a victory for Rick Ferreira. And Bob Root, before you say anything else, you came on the scene hurriedly and you was not invited. You are not my guest commentator. So I'm going to have to ask you to leave and I'm going to leave with you and go to the dressing room and try to get Ted DiBiase to come back to where he should have been in the first place. Thank you so much for your expert He's going to be fine. We'll Ted be DiBiase, never run in my match. Never run into my match. We promised we'd try to get Ted DiBiase, Ted.
We promised the fans what happened to you where it came emotional. This is an emotional sport. Tell us about it. Boyd, I know I did wrong. I know I broke one of the cardinal rules of Mid-South Wrestling by interfering in that match. But I spent six weeks with an injury recovering from the same people trying to cripple me. I just, it hit too close to home. I could not sit by and watch them cripple somebody else. If Mid-South sees fit to, uh, stick the fine on me. I'm not a wealthy man. I'm not taking it lightly, but I'll pay the fine. I apologize to you. I apologize to the fans in the Mid-South for breaking the rule, but I am not going to apologize for my actions. From now on, I want it to be known that I'm going to have, if I got to do like Dick Murdoch and use an entrenching tool or walk tall and carry a stick, I am going to be the aggressor. I'm not going to sit by anymore and get hurt and watch other people get hurt. Thank you, Ted. I'm just the host. I don't judge people. That'll be up to Charlie Lay and the board of directors from Mid-South right now. There's action in the ring. Let's go for the introduction. And it's tag team action now for one fall or remaining television time. In the red corner at 246 pounds, former North American heavyweight champion, The Grappler. And his partner at 265 pounds from New York City, Hacksaw Duggan. And in the blue corner at 234 pounds from Pango Pango, Coco Samoa. And his partner at 236 pounds from Portland, Oregon, Jesse Barr. The introduction, tag team action now. Jesse Barr and Coco Samoa teaming up against the masked grappler and Hacksaw Duggan. It'll be Barr against the grappler representing one man from their team, Alfred Neely, the referee. The grappler with a built up boot, he has a doctor's certificate that makes it legal for him to wear it, even though a lot of us don't agree with it. And on the outside of the ring, Hacksaw Duggan, as we remember from SMU Mustangs from Dallas, Texas, his collegiate career, nose guard, leading the specialty teams in Southwest Conference football action and then going on to become a great star for Atlanta in professional football, now at the top of the ranks in professional grappling. Ted DiBiase showing the courage, but he's human just like the rest of us. He had to do what he had to do, and he done it regardless of the consequences that he will have to suffer. Coco Samoa and the grappler. Jesse Barr comes in. Next week, Paul Orndorff will return. Two minutes, two minutes on the clock remaining. What a tremendous card we've seen, and it's still going on full blast in this Teague match. Paul Orndorff will be back. Alpha and Sika, the Samoan Warriors, will be on next week's card. Raptor now with Jesse Barr. Hexo Duggan coming in now. Rugged as they come. High in the air. Head first into the corner turnbuckle on the far side. He slams the head of Jesse Barr. Taking him to the ropes, he brings that back across the strand. Body slams him down. Simultaneously turns around and takes in his partner, the mass strapper, as Coco Samoa. Starting to chant on the outside for his partner, who's in a heap of trouble. And Coco Samoa comes in. Using his hands and his feet. One minute. One minute's all the time going left. This is a standby match. Coco Samoa coming down on the chest of the grappler. Hacksaw Duggan into the ring. Here comes Jesse Barr, all four men. Their time's running down. Barr and the grappler on this side. Duggan and Coco Samoa on the other side is Duggan. 30 seconds remaining. Remember, next week, Paul Orndorff will be back. Off and seek of the Samoan Warriors, and surely we'll have some kind of decision will be rendered on Ted DiBiase for his interference in that tag team match. We'll have it all next week as our time is gone. This is Boyd Fierce saying thank you so much for watching. Till next week, goodbye, everybody, from Mid-South Wrestling Television Network.